Uh, so, uh, Tom in Norway, um, let's do a short introduction. Who are you? Uh, yeah, I'm a firefighter, form, a former firefighter from uh, Bergen, working in the uh, Bergen Fire Service. Been working there for about 25 years. Also, um, uh, the last five years in the, in the, what do you call, as an officer, not uh, <clears throat> not uh, directly firefighter any longer. And um, I also was the founder of uh, Firefighter Fight Cancer in Norway. Uh, so we, for about, yes, seven, eight years ago, we started this this fight to to fight the cancer in uh, within the fire service and also uh, to uh, get the, the cancers approved as a uh, as a, what do you call it occupational <laughs> occupational yeah disease as you know so, uh, so why why did why did you start why did you start why did that become a, an interest of yours like a Goal. Yeah, um, you know, we were in a, in a meeting in in Finland actually, and um, this uh, I always we have always uh, thought that we were good taking care of ourselves, and we good to take the right precautions when we are out fighting fires and protect ourselves. Uh, but uh, w when we was in a meeting in Finland in 2010, 2011. Alex Forrest and uh, and the other guys uh, from Canada told us uh, how it how it, how it worked uh, regarding the chemicals and the smokes absorbs through the skin and and showed us the studies where they were unknown for us and we started to uh, to dig into it and uh, we saw that uh, this this was so much this was so serious and such a big problem among uh, uh, Norwegian and Nordic and uh, European firefighters that we just couldn't, we could not do something. We had to do something to, to stop the cancer within the fire service. And so we, we have kept going, <clears throat> worked together and, yeah, and uh, uh, kept going forward. Yeah, and we'll get back to what have you done and, and thought of what your process has been and, and thought of what your thoughts have been through the years and what they are right now. But let's take Tommy Denmark and have the same, you know, what's what's your backstory and, and why did you get into cancer prevention or fighting, you know, for the health of the firefighters? Yes, well, I'm uh, 56 years old. I started uh, my first education as firefighter in the state fire service in uh, back in 86. And there I was uh, for almost two years. And then I started my second uh, fire training in, in uh, Copenhagen Fire Brigade. And I was there for almost 26 years. Uh, so so I, I stopped and founded the Danish Cancer, Firefighters Cancer Society. Uh, same as uh, as Tommy Norway, actually, we was in the same meeting in Finland in, in uh, November 2010. Uh, actually, there was three topics. One was PTSD for firefighters. Next one was, uh, and I I had this um, a lecture about um, um, dangerous fires in foam insulation products. It's toxic and and all of this. And then uh, that was the cancer. And there it kind of clicked for me. There I was talking about toxicity in foam insulations how, and how, how it affected the lives of the citizens, the residents from, from within the fire. They wouldn't die of, of, the, of the fire itself, but of the toxins. And then they started talking about the toxins go into firefighters' bodies as well, causing cancers. You know, that's where actually it clicked for me, just like it did for Tommy and some other guys. Uh, and, um, well, we just had to, to make, make sure that th this was actually real, what we were shown. 
and uh, we, it didn't take long, very long. So, so we discovered this was uh, actually the real deal, and um, we've been fighting the same fight for the for yeah for the last eleven years now, uh, having this these specific cancers recognized as occupational diseases because it is what it is, right? So my my uh, my first take you know i started way later than you so i mean so my i had a different introduction but pretty much in sweden when i started and if i if i recall back it was basically still wear your breathing apparatus if you wear your breathing apparatus around the fire uh you're pretty much safe that's pretty much good and and there was there there was still i mean wash your gear i mean uh, you 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 would you would wash your gear uh, when it was visibly dirty, like it, it wasn't. It, I think it, when I started, it, let's say I started around 2010. Um, no, th- 2005. Uh, well, what was it? 2005. <laughs> it was. It was still. It was still like. You, it wasn't a sta- uh, a sign, a badge of honor anymore. It, that that has sort of sort of come and gone at that it started was like no you shouldn't have dirty gear it was it was still that if your if your helmet was too new that wasn't cool <laughs> but it shouldn't be dirty like even if you clean it it still look you know like old so i, I probably came in around where that started to have some recognition that you know dirt is probably not good for you but it there, it wasn't anywhere near the level of this right now and and there wasn't any facilities for washing gear and so on so so of course for me it also been a journey but not like starting in 86 where i guess nobody cared about anything besides the acute exposure of of smoke um now so so you started basically roughly the same time you started getting interested in 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 this topic and now feel free to anyone to ask your in in terms of re- this we say is a certain types of cancers being sort of looked at this seems to be overrepresented like what is your what is your take today on on what seems to be at least for your countries in Denmark and Norway what seems to be the cancer types that are overrepresented by firefighters? I'm gonna start in Norway, uh, Denmark. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, because I actually have the uh, <laughs> some numbers here. Uh, let me tell you that um, we have 27 different cancers, which is overrepresented in in firefighters uh, and so um, you know IAC uh, the international agency for research on cancer they have rated four different cancers we also have those four cancers which is uh, a melanoma prostate testic- testicular cancer and non-Hodgkin lymphoma they are overrepresented in, in firefighters but also also, what we have in our studies is um, something like heart cancers and cancers in the chest area. Those are really rare cancers, but the rare cancers hits on firefighters as well. They are rare, but they hit firefighters. And we see the same pattern all over the world. We are overrepresented in, in heart and chest cancers in, let me give you the right, the right number, 427% more likely for us to get those rare cancers than the general population, right? And, but again, we can always discuss these numbers and they are always on debate because are the numbers valid or are they not valid? It's kind of technical uh, terms, uh, but um, they are they are valid. Um, uh, but you have to see those numbers. For example, we know we know a compound as asbestos, right? We all know if you breathe in asbestos, there's a chance that you get um, lung 
cancers, the asbestos cancer, right? So if we look at the numbers of asbestos cancer uh, in Denmark, uh, let's see if I can find it here. It's, uh, I think it's point, uh, let's see, where, where do we have it? Uh, I don't have it here, point, point six five percent like we are underrepresented so if we should follow the logic of these all these scientific numbers asbestos should not be a problem for firefighters because we are lower than average yeah of course that is that's uh, insane thinking right so we always have to take care when we look at those numbers, what, what we should actually look at uh, for, for reasons is what are we breathing in through the lungs? What are we eating? What do we absorb through the skin? All those compounds, do they give cancer? Again, IAC has classified a lot of these uh, carcinogens as a group one carcinogens which means they are known to cause cancer in humans. We are exposed to a lot, most of these group one carcinogens when we fight fires. We can measure it inside our bodies. So what, what else do you need to prove this, right? I, I think that's, uh, I know because I, I, I've followed the debate internationally, even though I'm not directly in the debate because, I, you know, I, I do fire training, I do firefighter education, but I have n I've not been done um, fire cancer education or, or done anything to justify certain means besides tactically and so on, because I think that how I look at tactically how to fight fires, it aligns with, for instance, to also prevent cancer. So that, that's sort of a, a connection point. But from what I've heard so many talk about, there's been so much uh, people trying to prove, for instance, a statistical overrepresentation of a certain cancer type and then get that classified as occupational cancer and yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to tell you about the, the Norwegian studies uh, because uh, you know uh, both in Denmark and the North European countries as well there are there are different studies and with different strengths and shows different numbers. So that's, that has been a challenge for us uh, to, to know what kind of studies are waiting more than others. Uh, but in general, in, in the, we have found uh, in Norwegian uh, firefighters and Nordic firefighters, prostate cancer in early stage, uh, in young age, about 250, 60% higher uh, risk to get cancer, uh, prostate cancer, you have uh, skin cancers, uh, and you also have uh, mesothelioma, like uh, because of the asbestos. That's a higher range than other studies, and uh, and you know <clears throat> there are. I, I believe that firefighting occupation as occupation maybe is the most one of the most uh, studied uh, occupation in the world regarding cancer. Because there's a lots of studies around in the world, but they show dif uh, different numbers. But in average, they show, uh, in general, uh, almost between 20, 30 different cancers. In average, we are higher than the population in general. And, um, and <clears throat> but it, it, it's, it is not that high in one special cancer. It's, is a all over higher rate, and that that is uh, it's a challenge to document it uh, when you are trying to get this as an, to prove that the, the, the occupation is the reason. Uh, then you can't show that this is this is the factor. This is the, the cancer uh, causing agent because you have been you have been exposed for so many different kind of. Uh, chemicals in different cocktails and that that uh, depends on how your body works it, it hits you 
in different kind of cancers. So that's a big challenge uh, for firefighters today. Yeah, like like if I if I read you right and. It is, it is, and again, like I guess I tried to say in, in internationally, it is very hard to to link a certain type of cancer to firefighters. It will be different between different countries, to sort of like. But what you definitely can say that most countries can really show is that that you get some kind of cancer at a higher rate than the general public. And there are certain of those t- types, like, like, for instance, prostate cancer and, and so on, that, that might be even higher that you can certainly s- definitely link that to. But that sort of you get, um, that you get uh, an overall chance of getting cancer, but or the risk of getting cancer. And like you said, my understanding is also that since we're all s- such individuals and this mutation in the gene and so on can really happen anywhere at some level and it starts to build up when your when your body can't really break down so or recycle those misfolded proteins and so on and 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 so where you get cancer might be very far away from where you're actually exposed like there's been i heard a lot of talk about well get skin cancer on your on your forehead because you have your your helmet there and it's not being washed well maybe that's just just tough luck or maybe this direct exposure on the, on your forehead i don't know i just know that if you absorb something here maybe you get cancer in your in your ass i don't know yeah. <laughs> but, but it's, it's true like you say because um, there are so different kind of exposures you are exposed for and uh, some chemicals they are in in your under uh, clothes and when you wash it it spreads around and it's it's still in your underclothes and uh, you are exposed next time you wear them as well and you know like asbestos uh, the latency time you know from your the time from uh, when you are exposed until you get a, a tumor in your body it's between 20 and 40 years So, you you know, it's it's a far way ahead. The cancer hits you, uh, even though you were exposed for about 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So it's, uh, you know, you have to document the exposure. You have to show um, the government when you try to get the cancer as an occupational cancer. Uh, You have to, to, to prove that you are exposed to those chemicals 20 years ago. And today we are starting at systems and we have developed an uh, uh, application on your phone you can use to, to, to log all your kind, all kind of exposure you have for yourself. And, uh, and every employer, employer have to do that uh, regarding the laws in Norway. Uh, I don't know how it is in other countries, but I, I think the Nordic countries are pretty much the same that uh, the employers have to document all the exposure for, chem- for cancer-causing agents uh, in, the, in the work life. Uh, but that hasn't been done un- until recently. And so it's very difficult for each firefighter to, to prove that the, the, the work is the reason why they got the cancer. So I visited I visited Norway a couple of years ago, and I think I saw when you started really have using that that software that app where you where because the firefighters on that station were logging their exposure when we did training. Um, sadly, I there's I've heard very little debate in Sweden at all about directly logging exposure. Now, like all training is is, is logged usually in some kind of software but it's not directly logged to exposure like it's just clicked off as a fire training occasion and you don't really know was that you know wood based was it was a propane facility was it just a cold exercise so sweden hasn't really norway is really leading there over sweden which i don't really like to say uh but any <laughs> but so sweden has a long way to go there in terms of because i think that if I, you were ask me logging exposure and tracking and minimizing exposure that's where i see at least my 
effort would be rather than proving that you statistically have more cancer. It seems like a more reasonable approach to take to log exposure. I don't know. What do you say, Tommy, in Denmark? Yes, um, well, uh, I, I agree uh, actually with both of you because uh, um, I think actually Swedish firefighters can also use the Norwegian log, uh, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, so it's it's kind of free to for, for you to use as well, and it's not. Yeah, yeah. It, it's of course it's called an exposure app, right? But it's not. It, it, it's not like the individual firefighters have to uh, have to log in and write. Oh, now I was exposed to um, benzene or asbestos or whatever. It's I was at a fire. And this was a. An industrial fire, or a house fire, or a car fire, and my um, and I, I was a smoke diver, for example, or I was an, the engine uh, man, or whatever. So it's not about in the app. It's not about the exact uh, exposure type, but we know from other studies, for example, a car fire, what what carcinogens are coming from car fires what is coming from all different kinds of fires so that way the important thing is for you to know the last let's say 10 years i've been a smoke diver in a um, 105 um, uh, house fires 50 car fires etc and that way you would be able to prove, which means I have been exposed to all those carcinogens, right? Uh, linking to these cancers, which I got one of. You know, so that, that's kind of the deal. Uh, the, the app is, is, is I, I highly recommend that app for you to use uh, because it's your proof. What were you doing in that fire? Because it's, it's actually different if you um, if you approach the the fire service, they do not have those data. They are not obliged no. to 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 log those data. They can they can they can type in your name in the system and say, well, you've been on on duty uh, for these amounts of times, and you've been on calls five hundred times, but but. You know, it's it's a hell of a work to find out what did you do on that specific day, what did what were your position in that day? So so uh, like that, and 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 um, the only thing you have to register is exactly that: you were on duty, and you were on a call. Uh, and, and, yeah, and that's why it's it's called it's uh, actually in two versions now. It's a, a Norwegian ver version. And in English as well, and it's called my log or min log in Norwegian. And the, the reason is actually it's only you that owns it and know the log, and you don't have to use it if you don't want to. And uh, but it, it it's it's at the same time it 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 saves all your data for at least sixty years, so you know where you have it. And also it it's a kind of reminder for yourself. I think that you. Uh, as, as an instructor, firefighting instructor, uh, and w what we see is that, uh, okay, firefighters, they get the training, they uh, get their exposure, they, they warm smoke diving, uh, using the BEA, and uh, you have, you know, lots of fires you fight during a year, but instructors, they are more often in the fires as well. So you get, uh, <clears throat> every time you log your, your diving, uh, or use your exposure, you get a get a reminder of, of how often you have because you see the list in the end when you finish log, and you can see how often you actually gets exposed. And maybe you can see it's time for me to take a break now uh, regarding being an instructor, and and maybe uh, let other to to share the exposure to all the firefighters, and maybe. One guy don't get all exposure. You understand? So you can you can um, uh, yeah relate relate on it. You know. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, well, that, I'm very greedy. I like the exposure. I want it more for myself. I'm very <laughs> greedy. Uh, you, know, you know, Lars, actually, uh, if I may, um, yes. uh, as an instructor, you are one of the critical, important persons, actually, in, pro in, in the prevention. Because what we need is the, the right way of teaching new firefighters, rookies, to uh, behave the right way in the fire scene, right? And to wash themselves afterwards, how to get off their, their contaminated gear, how to handle all the gear, not only the clothes, but also the ax, the hose, whatever, everything. So you have to train that. The same way, because starting up would seem maybe for some very difficult, but in your academy, in all academies, right? When, um, when the trainee gets out of the vehicle, he puts on the helmet or she puts on the helmet. No matter what, it's just like a reflex because the instructor always said, oh, put on your helmet. And the argument was, well, we're not in the fire yet. We're not working yet. We're just standing here. It's not a debate, put on your helmet. So it's just a reflex. They always put on the helmet. That's it. We should have the same training when it comes to how we deal with our contaminated gear so that it just becomes natural. We deal with it this way. Everybody who, was, who, who, who drove the ambulance, for example, know everything about this because they don't want to be contaminated from the patients with, with, with all kinds of, of, of bad things. Uh, but, you know, hazards does not come from people alone, <laughs> like, like COVID, <laughs> to be accurate, but it comes from fires as well. And it's just as harmful, maybe even more harmful just over time, right? So, so we have to, uh, and, and uh, you mentioned in, in the beginning, uh, like it's a, it's a code of honor. You know, when I started as a firefighter, if we have a, if we had a car fire, we would we would fight it without the mad breathing apparatus because I mean we're outside, right? And I'm not a chicken, <laughs> uh, right? And all all those codes and they still exist in many parts of the world, even many parts of Europe, even some parts in the Nordic countries, right? But um, but you know. Who wants to deal with a, a filthy, dirty person? We want clean, <laughs> clean. Yeah, person, I think. Uh, right? I think. I think we have at least. At least we we have in, in the Nordic countries, and I think the you know most of Europe is, is swaying also. We've gone from the problem being a badge of honor to laziness. Um, so I think laziness is a much harder problem to solve right now, which is which it may be overcome a little bit by better infrastructure and so on. But we'll we'll, we'll probably get to that. But I think that lazy is, is today a much harder problem than 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 badge of honor. Now, I, before I move on, I want to ask a question because if my friends from the United States ask this, they're going to go like, why is it important to log exposure in the Nordic countries? We have, it, like you guys have socialized medicine. Like, why would it care? Like in the United States, if they get cancer, if it's not linked to their occupation, they might it might impact on what kind of health insurance they have. So it's very important for a lot of American firefighters. They're tracking their exposure someplace in America much, much more vigilant than, than we are. Uh, and, and they've done it for a longer time because it's it's very much in their self-interest to get to prove that it was caused by their work. Now, we have socialized medicine, so why need, do we need to do this, Tommy? Tommy, who? <laughs> Tommy, Tommy, Norway. Tommy Norway. You're the you're the Norway. guy behind the app. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the reason is uh, you have to. It's it's two uh, two things actually. And one of the things is actually um, that you get cancer, and and, we, and if you get cancer as a firefighter today, you don't. Uh, also, nobody recognizes. We call it the silent death in Norway because you get sick. And you're away from work, okay, a colleagues come visit and you get more ill 
and uh, if it's it's really bad, you die. You die in silence and it, uh, with the families uh, around, of course, and they are uh, very sorrow. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, but but I think that you have to you have to honor the people that uh, sacrificed their life for saving other peoples. So you have to prove this, and they have to get it, um, get that honor they need or, or they deserve uh, to to what you call the ultimate ul- ultimate sacrifice, you know, and 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 uh, that's one of the reasons. Uh, and and the other one is, of course, the, the practical things uh, regarding, you know, mostly of the firefighters they have a family. If you get ill. You get uh, the system today protect you very good. You get health treatment, you get uh, payments at least one year, and then you lose some of the payments, and then it loses, and then you lose more and more. And uh, and you, of course, that's that's a big issue for lots of people. They have kids, they have wives at home, and, and some actually uh, one colleague of mine he he got cancer in the age of 55 56 two years later he died of it uh, and actually uh, <clears throat> the widow kept the fight going on afterwards after the the firefighter was dead he kept the fight on the fighting and uh, she won the case actually so it was uh, like an, it was, it was an occupational cancer actually, and he got it approved. And uh, but on that road, uh, and uh, re- during the fight, she had to sell their house, and uh, because she she couldn't afford to to sit with it. And uh, she, they had a, a daughter, and um, and it, it was tough times for them. So of course, if you get the. the the cancer approved as occupational cancer as right is because all the studies shows it and all the, the you know all the theories and all and the, we who has worked on uh, with this for uh, many years we know uh, how things are, are put together uh, it's very important for the for the first for the, the firefighter himself or herself and of course in the second it's for the family as well so they are taken care of, actually. Hmm. Yeah, and I would say that it is that we have socialized medicine is a very small part of the help you get. And if it's classified as occupational, you get more support financially. Yeah. But like you said, I think it's also as as a as a researcher wannabe like I am, <laughs> I like, I like research, like collecting data and, and, and which is so important. Like if you log exposure, you collect data and that data is, is vital in that case, not maybe to justify your treatment. It might be, uh, something to justify your colleagues treatment because you aggregate that data and look at, okay, we're looking at this type of cancer and we have this kind of many exposures and so on. So it's not, n- not merely for you. It's also for for the, 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 the greater amount of, of the whole service. Of course, and that's a very good uh, good point. Is it's, of course, for every, every fight the firefighters do, they fight for the other, all the colleagues, of course. So we're moving one step forward for each fight we do. So we we know and i would say we know like you said we know that cancer is over in the fire service and 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 we're we're you know you're trying to prove it as an occupational uh, hazard also which is great we have people in sweden doing also a lot of other countries again coming into my like i'm going to be i'm going to be um um very self-centered here i do fire training so i mean for a personal sake i've tried to limit my exposure in a sense that I feel like bang for the buck, what is most important and so on. And, and I know you have made a lot of research lately and we'll get to other parts also, but I wanted to really cover this on starting to work on gear and how to wash gear and so on. Because of course, and I have a, I have a delicate problem because I travel all over the ro- world, all over the world. And every time I go to a place, I just, here's your gear. I don't know if it's washed or not. 
and, and uh, use it and maybe only get one set of gear for a whole week sometimes. You know, I travel to places where sometimes, you know, like th these are super dedicated volunteers and they have basically they fight fires with with dirt <laughs> like they have nothing. And, and I'm and I'm like, no, I'm going to I, I want five sets of gear. They're going to be clean. Like I, I saw so I, sometimes I have to. A lot of times I have to juggle <laughs> to, to sort of do the best of what I'm given. Um, but when I get back home to Sweden, it's sort of different. Like we have a much better infrastructure and so on. So again, but I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a self-centered guy like most people and go like, yeah, but if I, if I learn to protect myself, I can teach other, by other people to protect themselves. Um, and when I, when I, when I started, the fire service it was mandatory to use long johns we have we couldn't use shorts we couldn't use t-shirts now that gradually went away because the standard of the new fire fire gear and we'll get to that later the turnout gear um, became changed or they get altered so now they sort of prove that you didn't have to use long johns or long pants and and t-shirts anymore because you didn't you know the reason for it was also that of course a lot of things we do in our fire gear which is stupid to use fire gear for other things than firefighting <laughs> we can get to that but anyway I yeah it's totally it, it's yeah. Just, it's pure madness you run yeah. around in a in a, in a basically a winter fun. overall <laughs> it's just madness but anyway we'll get to that but anyway so they said well it's it's so good but you're getting overheated at a car crash for instance so you should be able to wear just t-shirts and, and a pair of shorts and you don't need as to take as much heat on a firefighting if you're taking that much heat you should be better using your stream or whatever so you shouldn't be able to take that much heat anyway so we started fighting fire in t-shirts and and shorts sort of below our, our bunker gear now, it's not until like a couple of years ago when the debate started really happening about how much, you know, smoke, of course, penetrated your gear. Now, you don't have any layer below that 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 stops stops it. And so let's start with what purpose does underwear play in terms of protecting you? This is this is very interesting. If if I can start, yeah. I, you know I've been into Canada, I've been to Australia, and I uh, and been to seminars and Tommy K from Denmark, and we have been uh, talking to firefighters in both places, and and uh, we also seen that, you know, where it's in in countries where it's where it's very hot and uh, they use sweaters or t-shirts underneath the bunker gear in norway all in all my career uh, for 25 years i've always used wool underwear uh, and that is because uh, the, the temperature control the wool does uh, and it keeps you dry on your skin it keeps you the, the moisture away mm -hmm. from the skin yes love wool love wool underwear yes, very good. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we have it's. Uh, I think it's a part of the the Nordic or at least Norwegian firefighting culture to do that. Oh, for sure, Norwegian. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And you're losing Kofta. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we use wool in every situation. Yes, actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and we love you good. for it. <laughs> but I have to also say that uh, we um, we uh, have started some studies in Norway uh, regarding this issue. And uh, one of them is uh, skin cancer. Uh, no, not skin cancer, but skin absor abo absorption, you know? And uh, that uh, chemicals go goes through your gear and onto your skin and absorbs that way. And then uh, the other one is uh, like a, a registered study. And uh, there are two big studies going on in Norway. And we are going to have a seminar in November, actually this year, and where a lot of uh, numbers are uh, announced, actually. So we are very, we are really looking forward to it as well. But some of the results, as uh, we are in the reference group, so we have uh, seen some of the results. And uh, one of them is um, this um, test they have done uh, regarding the underwear and uh, the wool underwear. And they found out that uh, if, you, if you got 
if you have one new suit and one uh, and two suits that are used in fighting fire, the similar fire, <clears throat> uh, the new one is the, the 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 one that they calibrate the the, 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 con the, the um, containings with, you know, uh, and then found uh, <clears throat> much exposure in the neck region and uh, on the hands and in the stomach level. And and we believe that it's not so much uh, chemicals that goes through the, the gear, the bump gear. You know, we call it the, the pump effect. When you sit down with the bumper gear, you blow out the air of the, of the neck, you know, and the air within your gear pushes out in the in the stomach region where the, the the suit is separated in two you know where you have your pants meet the jackets you know and when you rise up again it's in the same effect will will uh, suck in air in the surroundings in the neck and in the, the stomach area and also in the in the uh, with the hands so that's where Um, and the limit, uh, I, I can't remember the numbers now, but it, it was measurable. And then uh, measured the Bensu Operian, one of the PH, uh, PA ages. In Norwegian, it's polycycliske. What is the hill? Yeah, well, yeah. dangerous yeah. stuff. Dangerous <laughs> chemical. And uh, they. They also penetrate the skin, the skin uh, and also um, yeah, you can find it. You find it in mostly of the uh, fires today, and it's very uh, cancer-causing. It's a it's a cancer-causing agent, class one, and uh, they found it. And what's very interesting it, it, is when you wash, they wash the gear. It didn't go off. It, it reduced this about the half. But it also spread around uh, in in the um, wool, you know, from around the neck and around in the the whole whole uh, jacket, you know, the whole uh, sweater. Uh, so you got what we call cross contamination uh, from one place to another place. And so afterwards, they they um, got twenty, uh, you know, wool underwear. Uh, upper part from Bergen Fire Department and two other fire, Oslo Fire Department and uh, Nether Umark, three, I think it was three fire departments total. And they tried the same tests. And they see uh, very different uh, levels of uh, uh, agents in it. But it was the same, it was spread all over. So that means that if you wash contaminated gear in the washing machine. It spreads from one place on their clothes to another place. So what we learned from this is that you don't wash your underwear together with the way, also your personal underwear or your gym socks or gym uh, <clears throat> nasty uh, shorts and t-shirts and other sheets you don't wash that together with your underwear. Uh, under, uh, what do you call it? <clears throat> Long johns or a lot. The underwear for the fire underwear. Where fire you just, underwear. Yeah. You don't wash station it. wear is also like the station it wear. Yeah, yeah it, it should be washed separately. And the same with the, the fire gear as well. Uh, but that is a quite known uh, thing as well. But I, I don't think everybody has the opportunity to do that, to wash fire gear in, in, in dedicated machines to wash fire gear with. Because if you wash other clothes together with it, uh, they are getting contaminated as well. So clean fire gear from the washing machine isn't actually clean. It's only better, more clean, but not clean enough. So, and and that, that, that's uh, that's really interesting, Tommy, because we um, we are actually currently doing a study uh, in Denmark. We do it in in, in uh, the Danish Firefighter Cancer Society together with some universities, 
And uh, we call the study How Clean is Clean, right? And what we already found is that, um, like you say, Tommy, uh, you remove approximately 50% of, of the PAHs from the gear. Um, in some cases, actually, um, when you wash the traditional water wash in, in a professional washing machine with dose dosing systems into the, to, to the right chemicals into the washing machine and so on, you know, not, not just a household washing machine, but, but the real deal, right? <clears throat> and you have, you experience the cross contamination. Sometimes we actually see that the inner layer of the suit are more contaminated after washing <clears throat> due to the cross contamination. So, um, one important thing, uh, to remember, like if you play football in the field, you have grass, stains, uh, <coughs> sweat, uh, ground uh, dirt on your sweater or whatever, you wash it. It gets dirty, then you wash it. It becomes clean. But you're not dirty as a firefighter. You're contaminated. So when you're contaminated, you decontaminate. You don't wash you decontaminate. So many, many fire departments uses the words, well, we, uh, we uh, decon, right? We're going into decon, but they are not, that's not what they're doing. They are go going into gross wash. So when you are contaminated, you need to decontaminate. And that's not gonna happen in a traditional washing machine. We, we already know that. So, how clean is clean, right? What we want to find out is um, the particles, contaminants that are still in the fire suit. Would that be enough to cause harm in your body? So that would be our next step, right? We believe it is because the numbers are way above uh, the normal uh, levels, right? So we, we actually believe that, that it's harmful. Just wearing your uh, turnout gear, even, even if it's newly washed and, and clean, because it's not that clean. It can look clean. It m might even smell clean, but, but it's, it's really still contaminated. So that is a big deal, and which is why we have to use an additional layer underneath, like long johns, whatever, because it is another additional layer. But that will, in time, that will be contaminated as well from the clean fire suit, right? So in time, it just moves into your body, and, and it's not very long time, right? So, so um, to those guys and girls, firefighters, brothers and sisters in uh, in the warm countries, um, stating that that we don't want to use the the long johns, whatever, because it's too warm here. Um, well. Once you're inside the fire, you don't care. If, if, if that's a problem, uh, you, you, that you're too warm, you know, uh, you shouldn't go into a fire. I mean, once you're in the fire, you don't care if it's uh, 50 degrees outside or if it's raining or snowing or what. The, the, the temperatures inside the fire would be the same. It's how you are doing when you're not in the fire. Uh, Lars, like you said before, um, is it fair that we need a turnout gear to a car crash, right? Or to a, a, a oil spill on the street? That, that's ridiculous going into okay. that. Be already we know it contaminates us just wearing it. Why should we wear it for 
any other reason than fighting fires. So that, that, that's, uh, you know, I think that's quite important. That's a change of, of uh, culture. And of course, it re requires uh, a new set of gear to rescue situations, right? But, but well, buy another gear. The, my, your well, your I would say they will last longer. I, I, yeah, I, I know that when when this, it, it wasn't really. I think that the debate in maybe in Sweden, at least in my department, I know when I started to try to where I worked back then, I, when I started to to lift up the debate about why shouldn't we get another gear? Like why why don't we get a really good, you know, all weather gear for every f rescue opportunity? And the first, of course, was, well, it's expensive to have two gears. Yeah. Uh, and I go like, well, fire gear is very expensive and it's getting even more expensive. Like, why should you, why should you wear and tear on a fire gear when you're at a tra road traffic collision? Or like, why should you have bunker gear when you go to a, like a cardiac arrest? It's, it's madness. Like, both for financial standpoint that you, you know, use that very expensive piece of equipment. And, but also, of course, for like day to day worker satisfaction that is super hot, is bulky, it's not practical, it's, it's, even if it's cleaned, you know, it's a lot of times it's still sort of dirty. It's not, it smells and so on, even if it's clean. But then if you, if you add on to, to what we know today that it's, it's probably not clean enough. I can think, think we can for sure say that it's probably not clean enough with the methods we're using today. Like, and I, and from what I see now, how unclean is it? How dangerous is it? I would say that nobody knows, you know, like that's why you're trying, trying to find out, which is excellent. Like how clean is clean? I don't know. <laughs> but we try, again, we try different kinds of yeah. different ways of, of washing or decontaminating uh, industrial wash, uh, you know, uh, chemical washes. Uh, we try ozone decontamination. We try a uh, LCO2 decontamination. So all those data, once we have it, we will know the best way of, of cleaning bunker gear. And, and, um, and, and by the way, you can, you can actually have, and, and some uh, some uh, fire departments in the U.S. actually also in Sweden in in, in Göteborg, they have um, they have some fire suits where you can take off when you come out from the fire, you can take off the outer layer, put it in the back. Of course, you have to handle it right. Put it in the back and wash it separately. The outer layer that's really contaminated, right? So the, the two inner layers, you can take that off afterwards, bag it, and wash it separately. That way, you avoid uh, the cross-contamination. And, and that, 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 that's, uh, that's a good thing they have in, in, in Göteborg and, and in some, uh, some, um, somewhere in, in, in the States as well. That, that's great. Well, I want I want to get back more to uh, there's so many th threads here I need to <laughs> remember to get back sorry, on. Sorry about that. No, no, it's no, it's excellent. You know, it's just there's so, so many things I I need to to listen about. So if we did go back even further, like, we we started with the first question about underwear. So uh, um, uh, is there when I started again, like wool, fantastic. It's the most comfortable thing to have below. Like when you get, I sweat a lot. And if I don't have wool, it's really uncomfortable. It doesn't matter if I have some kind of function wear that dries really, really fast. Again, it doesn't matter. I'm soaking wet anyway. Or if I have more common, which were back in the day that you could only use cotton because cotton doesn't melt. And that was, that was supposed to be a good thing. Uh, but then we realized that if, like, if your skin is melting temperature of plastic, Plastic, you you it's, it's not a good day anyway so uh, so we started like allowing uh synthetics for like functional synthetics with a high very high melting point but anyway i i never liked those so wool for me was was the optimal but now i like starting to think like is wool so so there's a there's a problem with washing like tom in norway said like we try to look at like underwear and cross contamination when i get back home Sure, I can treat I can treat my 
personal wool underwear. I can treat them as pretty much contaminated. Like I, I put them on when I'm supposed to go into training and I go out, I take them off and I go to shower and then I clean them as good as I can. But roughly, at least today in Sweden, you know, underwear is still just washed in normal washing machines. Like they could be dedicated for that because sort of you don't want to have clean, you know, like, like your normal clothes in that. But, but still, it's still just a normal washing machine. And then afterwards, I put it on a, in my, in my bags, which are airtight. And I put money in my basement. If there's my personal when I go training or in my firehouse, they stay there. So I, you could limit the amount of time you spend in those potentially contaminated. When I was at working full time, we had our station gear, which was the same thing. They went out to fires. So we we spent the whole day in our station wear, which is potentially then not good. Because, of course, when you when you get a call, you had 90 seconds, so you didn't have cha- time. At least we didn't perceive ourselves to have time to switch into something else. So we walked in, in potentially, you know, contaminated underwear. Now, my question is, first is, do you think there's a difference in how clean a wool sweater could be compared to a cotton sweater, how it could be, or how clean a functional sweater, like some kind of synthetics, how clean that could be with a normal washing machine? Do you think there would be a difference? You know, <clears throat> that would be speculations for our side. There are no uh, documentation that says one one is better than the other uh, regarding washing. Yeah, but uh, what I think is that wool is, is the best thing regarding regulating your body temperature. So that's, but uh, I know that one of the science uh, scientists uh, said that maybe wool is not so sufficient because there, if you look at wool in microscope, it's lots of, lots of small kind of hairs, you know, lots of air bubbles. And lots of places where the contaminations agents can hide, you know, in the washing. So they might absorb more agents, but that that will be theoretical. Theoretical, and I don't know if that's right, you know. Uh, so we have to do more science regarding this to get the right uh, underwear. Actually, maybe, maybe. You know, in Norway, wool wool is quite expensive, but it's very good. Everybody uses it. When you go to mountains hiking, everybody has wools on their body to regulate the body temperature because it's, it's, it's quite warm even though it's wet uh, and it keeps you cold when you are too hot. So it's, 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 it's very good. But maybe it's time for us to go for a much cheaper uh, super underwear you go into, you use it one time and you throw it in the basket. It's it's garbage afterwards. Maybe you don't one time. If you have kind of one time one time suits, maybe that's the right way to go. But we don't know yet. We need more science to to know what's the right to do. Maybe we we have. A, I know that there are uh, some uh, washing uh, industries that says that they have the right uh, chemicals, the right soaps, and the right way to wash the clothes to get it clean. Uh, but uh, I still haven't got the, the and s- still haven't seen all the science there. Uh, but I know CO2 can uh, work as well as a decom- de- to decon uh, the gear, but that's very expensive as well. But what I can say is that from when I started in the fire service and until today, the fire service has made a huge step in the right direction. As you know, from the badge of honor, dirty uh, gear, to have uh, every to to have the possibility to wash your gear, and now you have a spare gear you can wear when you the other one is to wash, and uh, the attitude amongst firefighters is much better regarding. Uh, the smoke and exposure and also in Norway the last five years maybe have been built about yeah, 30 to 50 new fire stations to just keep uh, the change or the, the difference between dirty zones and clean zones and it's, it's 
have been a, a big change in the Norwegian fire service. So that's very good. So we are heading in the right direction, of course. That's, that's very good. <clears throat> yeah, let me add something to that, Tommy, because uh, we see the same thing in, in, in all the Nordic countries, actually, for the, the prevention measures, which is really good, really good uh, with the clean fire stations. We're Maybe we're behind on that field in Denmark, but we're getting there. Um, I, I think Finland is really, really top of, of, of the pop there <laughs> regarding to fire stations. And, and um, um, I don't think maybe I agree totally on, uh, you know, using like one use underwear and then throw it away. But that's more because of the environment, right? No, I totally we, we, don't, we don't want to produce uh, garbage, so so um, we 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 better we better find out uh, the best way to decontaminate, right? And and uh, as you mentioned, the LCO2 system. Uh, what I miss as well is the science behind. I've asked for it several times, and I was promised it. Um, I, I saw some something. Uh, and and uh, what I saw it uh, are all the good stuff, right? <laughs> but what's behind? I mean, I want to see it all. Uh, so that's also why we are doing that in our how clean is clean study, because then we then we'll do the study ourselves, right? To 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 see the best way, and if. If that is the best way, or maybe ozone, that 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 could be it as well. Uh, that that would be the solution on woolware, right? So so um, so maybe the, maybe the solution is there. So and once you have those expensive you know, washing uh, facilities, uh, it's not like you have to to have one washing facility per fire station, right? I mean, one, one uh, decon, decon uh, station <laughs> um, facility would be able to cover many fire stations, right? So it's, it's, it's really not that expensive uh, when you count it out like that, right? Of course, you need the logistics and, and, and still there are poor countries, poor municipalities, and so on, so, and they simply just cannot afford it. And they simply cannot afford buying two sets of bunker gear for each firefighter, and so on. Well, um, I, I bet, I bet the health insurance and the, the, the treatments on hospitals and so on for the sick firefighters are even more expensive. So, you know, sometimes fire departments, municipalities, and, and the government, the state government, have to work together to solve these problems. Because it's not, it's not going away, it's not disappearing. We are only producing more and more sick firefighters, which is not good for anybody, right? It's not good for economy, it's not good for <laughs> the firefighter and families, obviously. It's not good for the citizens as well, because, and the fire department, because they have to train and educate a new firefighter every time somebody goes away, even if it's on pension or, or, or by death or sickness or whatever. So, I mean, it makes no sense to talk about we cannot afford it. It's a matter of coordination and priorities. It's as simple as that, really. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think the, the, like the study of how, how clean is clean is so important or that, that those kind of studies, because I think that politicians, of course, rightly so need to 
make a balance sheet. Like how expensive is a firefighter getting sick? How expensive is it to train a new firefighter, even though it's not occupational health, even if that is not even proved and so on. And they weigh it on how much does it cost to, to prevent it? Now, if, if you're saying, I remember in my fire station when we started, you know, building a more clean fire station, there was a lot of suggestions. We need to buy this washing machine. You need to buy this and this and this, but nobody could say that it did any difference. And that's exactly. that's really hard. Like how how do how do how do you write a report to the fire chief and the fire chief goes to the politicians and say we need we need a hundred thousand kroners or a million kron million kroners and we think it will help. Like that's not a very I strong argument. I, I know I, I know and and that's exactly why we're doing these studies. Also, yeah. I mean, it could be used for for those purposes, right? Uh, it's all about prevention. Another thing that we should we should do as society is actually to create screening programs, like a, like you have a, a a health check. All firefighters ought to have a health check, a yearly health check. For you know, somebody already had that. Uh, today, I I talked to a brother firefighter. In Iran, right? We, we would we would think Iran. Wow, that's a, that's not a really developed country, and, and and all that, all our prejudices. But in Iran, actually, all firefighters have a yearly health check: ears, uh, eyes, <laughs> your whole body. They have blood samples uh, for car and cardiac. Um, um, uh, they don't have cancer. We, we, that's actually what we talked about in the meeting to, uh, earlier today. And um, they, they wanted to introduce that also to, to, to their uh, municipalities that will go to the government and, and you know, use their system. And, and um, uh, you know, the reaction was, well, we're going to do that. Why not? It's not a problem. We are already doing a health check, yearly health check. So if we should have uh, another blood sample uh, or a cancer screenings, why not? They, they actually saw no problem in, 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 in having that done for them. So, you know, different places, uh, different countries in, around the world, together, we are doing everything right. But each single country are doing something right and a lot of things wrong. So to, together we should learn from each other and, and, and uh, develop that way. And, and that's what we're good at, firefighters, because we are a brotherhood. We have brothers and sisters all around the world. Uh, politicians can do the politics <laughs> from one state to another, uh, you know. Uh, they, they could actually learn a lot about uh, from firefighters because we are brothers and sisters no matter where we are. And we gladly share knowledge and don't hide anything from each other, right? So, so um, together we can do the right thing to do the right protection for firefighters. Uh, and, and actually, we <clears throat> about the occupational um, uh, uh, recognition and the... the uh, the legislation, right? The presumptive legislation. Uh, the city in, in, in Canada who got this, uh, who implemented this for, for, for the longest time is Edmonton, Edmonton in, in, in Canada. And uh, they have some economic calculations on this issue. So what they say is, is in general is for every dollar spent on um, on the firefighters uh, prevention and, and health is two dollars saved for society so we have to we, we have to get out of the box thinking right and think of, of, of the the greater perspective and also their insurance their health insurance uh, uh, no, no workers compensation insurance that is it didn't even um, it didn't even go up. They didn't even the, the employers didn't even have to pay more to that insurance. 
right? So, so it's really, it's not an economical issue. It's an issue of taking action. We just have to convince our politicians, actually, because those are the ones that, that, that can make the legislations. And, um, and for, for doing that, uh, us firefighters, we need to cooperate also with our chiefs. And, and, and actually educate our chiefs. Because like in Norway, as in Denmark, um, 10 years ago, 11 years, before 2010, they didn't do anything. Like nothing, right? So we brought this issue up, more and more debate, and now we are doing a lot of prevention, right? And, and, and which is really good. Some fire stations are doing something. Uh, some are doing something else. Together, we, we're doing the right thing, <laughs> right? So, so um, not so one I wa- fire I wanna, station yeah. doing the right. Everything good, but together, I, you know, yeah. I, I, yeah, I would think, yeah, as well. Uh, and I, I see we are going in the right direction, but the legislation in Europe needs to be changed for firefighter regarding occupational cancer. So it's we need to adopt the presumptive legislation like they got in Australia, Canada, and mostly of the United States. So it's, they, that's a that's a fair protection for firefighters. Okay. So when then when that said, we are we had, we have done a lot of right things, preventional. Uh, we need to uh, have sc- more screening programs, like Tommy says. But one thing we haven't focused on uh, so much yet, and this is uh, your uh, uh, area, <laughs> this is, you know, the tactics regarding fighting fires. We are, we have, um, you know, using BAs, indoor <clears throat> firefighting, uh, you know, we call it surgical firefighting, go inside, you don't use water, and you put out, you, you, you cool down the, the gases and you go inside almost in the fire. You know, maybe we should use other tactics to stop the fires. I, I haven't got the numbers of how many times I've been doing this, go inside and smoke lots of hot, black, warm smoke. And uh, we have fought and done, a, we thought we have done a, a really good job and uh, 14 days afterwards, uh, big machines stands beside the house and tearing it apart. So you have building, yeah. yeah, you know, and we have actually exposed ourselves and uh, got lots of chemicals and what was the news actually. So we have to, to also re-evaluate uh, the value of what we are doing. Because every time we ex- expose our firefighters for smoke, uh, it's a cost to the society as well. I remember uh, I went uh, did a training with a Norwegian fire department, and I met a very interesting firefighter. He said, "You know, firefighters shouldn't do interior firefighting anymore. We just should we just build houses. So we build a house on the backyard of the fire station, and whenever there's a fire, we let it burn to the ground. We give them a new house. That would be more. That would be more of a value to our community. <laughs> and and you know the, the the sad part is that he's got a lot of points there. Like mm-hmm. it, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, now we still have to save lives, and it's a lot of times it's very hard to say that." Their lives, but but there's there's always some truths in inconvenient uh, thoughts <laughs> that we need to, do. and for sure there is a like um, the tactical development and then cooling from outside and so on, and and using ventilation more aggressively than we have done in the past. That those are for sure pieces of the puzzle to also reduce exposure. But I still want to go back because there's too many things I have to say. You know, like we talked about the underwear, and when I. Uh, so we we talked about we don't really know if what kind of underwear we should have like material wise. I would say that I haven't heard anything else from around the world that should suggest that you know this is the best type of underwear. Besides, you know, like wearing long johns and long sleeve is probably good because the 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 outer scale, the outer skin of the bunker gear is probably contaminated. You want an extra layer. Like if you can have two layers, that's probably even better. But you'll walk like this. Um, 
So that's probably good. Now, <clears throat> there's a Swedish, I know there's a Swedish development of uh, an active carbon underwear, which is like the radical different approach to the simple one-time use. That's the very expensive multi-use. Uh, now, that's going to be interesting to see when that k- hits the market and so on. So uh, um, hopefully I can talk to Anders later and, and talk about that development. of It's actually active carbon, so it's an actively bonds to the PAH. Now, that only protects you to some of the chemicals that actually are interested in sticking to the active carbon but it's still a very interesting uh, development now we talked about the pumping effect it's interesting because i talked to an expert on fire gear i don't know maybe five years ago and we talked about the swedish hood because the swedish hood is fairly different towards pretty much everywhere else like in in norway you don't have the hood you have the the collar and then you have the 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 exposure protection here like you have some kind of 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 <clears throat> of fabric going down the neck and that's pretty much how it looks like in the britain in france and germany and so on and, and the flame and, mode, flame mode. yeah 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 and there's a flame mode below that i'm um, talking about the outer absolutely yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then because the these this guy who was from britain said well it's just stupid of you you swedish guys because you your 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 gear doesn't work as a, as a heat pump anymore you're, you're not pumping out warm air when you're doing body work and I was like, well, our, our gear wasn't designed to do a lot of work without heat. Like it was designed to do a lot of work with, with heat. We don't want to pump in warm, warm air from the fire. Like I had never, I, back then I didn't think about like you're pumping, get, you're pumping smoke in. So you're, you're pumping more chemicals in. That, w- that wasn't part of the equation. That wasn't part of why Sweden did it. Sweden did it because it looks like seal yourself more when you're going into the bad stuff. Now, again, the heat pump it makes a lot of sense if you're working in bunker gear at a, at a a traffic accident like it makes a lot of sense to pump out all that body heat um but now it it if i look at it let's let's just say that you can you know use your magic pen and your departments had rescue gear for everything else because it there's no good argument for using fire gear at anything else than fire so let's just that, that, that's, that's gone so let's say we're going to a fire that it still makes a lot of sense to, in that case, to have an exterior hood where you try to make as, 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 as tight as possible. And you want to have the Danish overalls, like you, the, 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 which you sort of stopped using, you idiot. Uh, why did you? <laughs> no, but, yeah. no, sorry. But you, you used you used the overalls like forever, like where you where the suit and pants stick together, and yeah. you're 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 removing that whole barrier between between the, 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 the that. So uh, a a whole full hood and overall, and then of course mu- you know cuffs at your wrist that are particle. That, that that should be the optimal gear for going into fires. Or am I wrong? No, you're right. Uh, I had the th- same ideas, and, and uh, actually, I'm speaking uh, with the with the producers about that. Um, the problem was that um, uh, you're kind of you're. It's not very flexible, right? So when you when you sit down, for example, uh, your your legs is like pulling up. <laughs> uh, you know stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So it's not re- really flexible. Uh, so so um, so we just went to to the the, the two part uh, gear, and and like everybody uses that. I, I I would love to go back to the to the to the the, the whole body suit. It's because uh, I I and, I, let, and, I like you told me I'll just jump in before because I was trying I was trying to look just the other day on Facebook and see is there anyone manufacturing overall anymore because sort of I can sort of say that well for operational duties sure the two piece of course is flexible um, but for training like I don't want I want to want to be flexible anytime in, in the container I want to be you know I want to be I want to be better protected so I wanted an overall and good good flaps to protect myself when doing training but I couldn't find it anymore like nobody sort of nobody there's like very few that I could find like there was a Russian version that was sort of like, like it's not even EN certified it's very hard like no one does that anymore Tommy 
Yeah, I, but I think that the, the development regarding uh, split uh, rocket gear is, is it's more practical. You can use only the jacket if you want to in this, some kind of case, but it's just hanging together with it, all uh, this. The, 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 what kind of incidents you are using the bunker gear at, you know? Sometimes you just use your jacket, sometimes you use your it's very warm, you want to take off your jacket because it's sunny outside. So, you know, you have a more, more uh, different kind of choices when when you have split gear, you know, bunker uh, jacket, jacket and jacket. And, and I also want to say something about uh, this um, <clears throat> pumping effect. Because I have been in workshop with manufacturers as well uh, regarding this. And, uh, Ooh, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Tommy, I, I, I muted the wrong Tommy. <laughs> so, okay, Tommy Norway, sorry. put your mic yeah. again. Yeah. We were looking at in the workshop and with what kind of uh, membranes are best or, or how should it be uh, membranes in, in, in the, the bunker gear as well to keep the, to keep the, the, the wet uh, on the outside, you know? And, uh, and the, uh, they told us actually it's it's very it's very closed. There's not not much that can come through the bunker gear. Uh, so the next now is to to make the right design of the the suit. You know, to make it uh, the, the pumping effect. I don't think we can uh, as as long as we are moving and uh, going up and down. You have you have to have uh, you you know in a in a diving suit you have this vacuum in the suit if you don't take in some air so somewhere you have to keep the air uh, the air in the in the suit or if you go down it pushes out or if you don't do it you blow up like a Michelin gun you know <laughs> so that's that's the thing we need to find a solution on if there is come some kind of filters. Uh, ventilator uh, when some areas of the suit there are some kind of filters where the, the air can pass through and the filter uh, maybe some carbon filters or something that uh, takes the uh, agents you know away I don't know but that's the, the, I think that uh, we need to develop a good design that's, that, that's the next step regarding uh, bunker gear <clears throat> yeah, because I, I also talked to manufacturers and, and I talked to multi multiple or representatives of manufacturers that, that claim the same thing. And, and I have no reason to, to, to not believe them. Like if you, if you can, if you can, a normal, uh, uh, Gore-Tex or, you know, like the vapor barrier, like they're so, they're so tiny that, you know, like most particles can't get through. So particles should be blown. Like gas, this is a different problem. But if you want a gas tight, that's sort of like, that's sort of like impossible. But we're talking mm. tiny particles, like vapor barriers should be a very good resistant to, to particles. Like it's the same thing. So if you have, you know, particle hoods, which at least to me seems like a good idea, unless you're washing them and moving the contaminants to the inside and then you're back to square one, who knows? I, you know, you're, you're going to solve that problem, which is good. And you just tell me the results. Uh, <laughs> but, but reducing that pumping effect with at least an overall, uh, that was my idea. And I know that the, the Viking suit has a, a girder. You can put on uh, like the part you can put on a girder around so you can actually attach. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the, the snow lock on the boots, which is great. And there's, uh, I know the, the, I know it's the, I don't know if it's the same as the Gothenburg. They have the Guardian version mm -hmm. of, of Viking suit, but there's a particle X. Yeah, Gertis on, on yeah particle X there, and because I know that that's the particle X that they have this girder where you can sort of attach the pants to the jacket and get some at least some extra protection in terms of not as much. Yeah, you're skeptical. <laughs> I haven't even seen it, so I don't know. But that was the only th that, that was the only one at least I've seen as a manufacturer tried to address that problem with 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 you know air going through the jacket too easily least make it a little bit harder and again i think that makes sense ah tommy you have to unmute yourself 
It was me who muted you because you were, you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was making noise. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so, um, <clears throat> yeah. You mentioned the Part X uh, system, uh, and it's actually uh, they, they're not only developing this uh, system, but but um, they test it as well. So, so they they are actually the only ones who can show results that this actually reduces uh, uh, the pumping effect. For particles, uh, yeah. and 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 that's that was a very important uh, statement there. It's for particles, not for the gases. Uh, the, the the VOCs are just as harmful as as the PAHs. Yeah, it uh, so, just goes so, straight through. So, and, and and so this just proves that um, we can we can do a lot of things to protect ourselves, but we cannot do everything, right? Uh, so, so um, back to the occupational disease. Yeah. It, it it is an occupational hazard. So, so we we can't be protected one hundred percent. So, so and, well, we have and, we have a, like like the, there is a, no yeah no I think that one hundred percent is never going to be possible. Like with with everything, it's about. Again, like time density and, and, and time. Again, like you re reduce the, the exposure as much as possible. Like, you know, clean your gear, clean it in the right way. And that's getting better. Have a good design gear. Again, don't wear neither underwear or your bunk gear more than you have to. Exactly. And that's a good that's point. And, 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 you know, more and more fire services actually um, are making, well, most make trailers because that's the cheap solution. But we have in 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 um, in, in one of the cities in, in in Denmark, they created a like a truck, a fire truck. It's just it's it's just um, a, a bathing truck actually, <laughs> where as soon as you get out of the fire, right, the two smoke divers they go to that truck and they are helped off their fire suit, backed it, they go into the vehicle, take off the rest of their clothes, go into the next room for a shower, go into the third room, there are some, there are shelves with clean gear. And then they go out of the vehicle again, right? So already on the scene, they can uh, change their clothes. They can have a shower. So more and more, that's one of the, the great things that they are doing in, in, at least in Denmark at the moment. And and uh, that, that's really that good. It's and it's also like if you if you've been a, an officer, you know that if you send firefighters in, and then the second time you send them in, you know the efficiency of their work is going to go down fifty percent. Like they're tired. And they're sweaty. They're cold. Like it's not comfortable when you go outside and sit for a while, and then you gotta just do work again. Like it's it's not it's not comfortable. You're not you're not performing your A game. So, and if you combine that with how how many you you need like sort of with like washing, you need a that, that kind of 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 you know depot vehicle for the, each every region needs to have one. There there's not many fires. It could come a half an hour later, yeah, and then you matter. can have yeah. that. The cost for it is not much. You you get into new gears, but uh, so the, the you get cancer prevention, but you also get a huge booth in just morality and and efficiency of the crew. So I I, I totally agree that that's that's not a very expensive thing to achieve. It's sort of very doable, and it, of course also if in in Sweden and Norway and Denmark, I see that there's a lot less emphasis on the heat stress. Uh, at real incidents compared to United States. And of course, we don't, we are not very warm countries. So it's sort of understandable. When, but, but when you, a firefighter in Phoenix go inside a house fire and they go out to prepare for maybe going inside again and doing overhaul or something, they're sitting down in, in like ice bucket chairs with their eye, you know, in, with their forearms in, in cold, cold water, ice water and other things like they can go into that also, but also for heat recovery. Because heat stress is also probably one of the things that causes breakdown of, of, of DNA and RNA and so on. So I think that that's also probably linked to cancer, but also like neurogenic diseases and so on. So that this, this also to get 
and the ability to quickly shower, get out and, and do and do some kind of heat recovery is probably also good even for cold climates before we go inside again. Uh, I want to go back again. So we talked about the underwear. We talked about, uh, you know, like the outer shell, uh, the outer shell, both of them problematic to clean. You know, a lot of countries are looking into how to better clean them. And, and it's very exciting to see how clean clean is and how you clean it most efficiently. Honest answer, most people don't know. We just don't. So again, reducing the exposure, don't wear your underwear or your bunk gear more than necessary. Is sort of an, and that's that is something I've tried to personally um, um, follow as much as I can. Now, sometimes I'm too lazy to do it, to take it off when I should, or 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 replace it and so on. So lazy is a big problem, and a lot of times I don't have the possibility even because I know that I don't have a second gear when I go training, and you know I'm I'm put that. Now I've, I've thought about it for my own good that I should bring my own gear more. But then you have like, if I bring my gear to another country, I bring like say two sets of gear and then I'm going to bring that home. It's dirty. It's boxes. It's, it's, it's just a, it's like an infrastructure mess. Like it's just a whole, it's this, this, this whole infrastructure is just complicated. Now, some departments of it, which I think is interesting, but also problematic is a lot of countries have outsourced their, their, their handling of dirty gear and everything. Now, the problematic part of that is, do the companies that take care of those gear have any idea what they're doing and what they're exposing themselves to, which seems to be not the the, the case. But I think it might, it's interesting because there's a lot of companies that know a lot more about cleaning has other facilities than the fire service to handle, you know, every type of medical contaminated gear in very good facilities. Maybe they should handle fire gear too. Uh, so that that make make and um, they may make a lot of sense to outsource that instead of doing it in house. I think. Now again, it's perfectly uh, fine for a company to say, "Okay, so how clean do you want it?" Because it's going to be a bill. Like how how clean do you want it? And you know, you, the 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 more you spec in saying we want this level of. P O P H uh, H and uh, V O C and so on, and then they, they will stick a price tag to it. But that might be a solution. But in that case, the politician, the fire chief, has to say, "Okay, I want this level of clean." And right now, we don't know. Oh, it's hard to say at least what level of clean do we want it to be. But I think outsourcing is a very good mm -hmm. example because I, it might be that this is a this is a high skill and equipment uh intensive operation to clean stuff and the fire service might not be the ones who should be cleaning stuff professionally um there was one thing i wanted to before i moved on um damn it i lost my thread it was it was it was about yeah, yeah, so well, we started talking a little bit about, about, uh, in the beginning, about personable, personal, uh, traits or personal, uh, what do you call it, habits. Like, how do you personally handle your gear? Because I didn't think about that because I saw, it was uh, some years ago, I saw an American video about, it was before UL made their video about how to take off your gear. Like, you know, don't, like don't take your flash hood and pull it down around your neck because now the outside of your flash hood is is rub against your skin and so on all those things so that was where when i started trying to learn myself to take off you know my my flash hood in the way that it doesn't expose my skin but i have one question <clears throat> like you you could and, and that's for sure something new firefighters should really learn and get like you say with the helmet like get into a habit how do you how do you take off your gear like leaving your breathing apparatus to last and so on how do you take off your gear to reduce exposure after you've been inside a fire or after training but i one thing that's that's always been a problem for me is that gloves you know, way before the washing results started coming in, that w gloves are super hard to clean. Like inside of gloves is a massive problem. And yeah, like I said, now I, I use, always use, 
you know, like uh, medical gloves before it, which is a lot of countries go like, <gasps> you can't do that because they will melt and then you will die. Uh, <laughs> but I pretty much always use that unless there's a real fire call. I probably don't use it, but in training, I always use it because I, I, I consider the inside of my gloves to be a cancer madness. Um, how do you look at that? Or what is this anything else you want to react to, Dan, uh, Tommy, Denmark? The cotton gloves protect you from soot up to 80%. How do, we, how do we know that? Because We know like, that because uh, there's, uh, there's been made fin uh, Finnish studies. Um, one of our, uh, uh, let's say, friends, uh, scientists, uh, Juhai Leitinen, made those studies. And if you, if you go to Hola, uh, the, the, the fire academy in Finland, and also in, in, in many of the fire stations in Finland, you will always see white cotton gloves on, on the hands of firefighters in training and in real life. They are in boxes all over the, the, the fire stations. So, so that's a mm, one-time use. <laughs> They're not trying to wash those? They are not washing those uh, as it is uh, as 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 it is now. Maybe when there are solutions that are really decontaminating, uh, th they would start doing that. Yeah, but but uh, so so that's the good thing about the cotton gloves. The I nitro, to, yeah. yeah. If, if, if I if I can cut in, uh, because my experience is, I, I'll also talk to you uh, regarding this issue. But my experience is very often when you coming out of a house, you've been firefighting, you're soaking wet in your, in your gloves. You can turn them around and it <clears throat> drips water out. And, and then you're wet and then you have, are exposed. And many days afterwards, you, you, you can smell the ash smell uh, from, your, from your hands. So uh, after I, th this is my personal experiences. When I started using nitrile gloves, that stopped. I didn't get the smell yet, and uh, but yeah, uh, I that, have. That's what that's what I w w was supposed uh, about okay, to, so, to, to so say so actually <laughs> now because because uh, the, that's a good thing about the cotton gloves. The 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 good thing about nitro gloves is that they are protecting you even more. However, <laughs> the your wet <coughs> your wet hands, putting them uh, putting them into into plastic, so to speak, is not very healthy for your hands. So, said that, it's, it, it, it must be, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Because if you're fighting a fire, you are not there more than 20, 30 minutes. Then you can take them off like and, 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 so, and, and, and wash your hands. So, so it, you have to consider what's best for you in, in, in which situation, right? But we uh, already have experiences Norway more than ever uh, uh, about electric car fires, right? And there are in some of the batteries uh, there are magnesium, and um, if you are so lucky to be able to put water on the batteries, which is of course the big problem, and you hit the magnesium, that ignites. Just getting into contact with the water, right? And we saw, I, I have the evidence, pictures with um, magnesium, it explodes. And what is, what is the closest thing to, uh, to the explosion is you, the firefighter's hands, obviously, trying to put out the fire. So the magnesium goes onto the gloves and burns through the gloves. And you have big burns on your skin. So, would you prefer nitro gloves if that happens to you, or would you prefer uh, uh, cotton gloves? Like, you know, there are so many aspects in this, but one thing is for sure, under gloves is a wise thing to do. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Tommy. And, and uh, I also uh, know about experiences where they've been inside fighting fires with nitrile gloves, and you get this, uh, not back rough, but you have this, uh, oh, it, 
ignition, the fire gases, and, and suddenly uh, temperature rises a lot, and uh, you have the moisture within the nitro gloves, and you, it turns to steam, and you have this steam effect on your on your hands, so you get uh, you got kind quite uh, bad burns on your hands as well. But but my thoughts about this is uh, okay. Maybe you shouldn't have been in there. Maybe you should take some precautions to prevent the overall or, or not the overall, but the, the ignition of the gases. So, uh, but because you get some other burns as well. So uh, mm -hmm. then you should. Sh probably approach the situation on, in another way, you know, and to uh, avoid uh, the, the ignition of the gases. So uh, I, my thoughts are that use the nitro gloves or uh, wool or cotton gloves. Uh, but my experience is use nitro because it protects you best, uh, as best as you can. And uh, then you fight fires, in in uh, in a way that don't put you in a situation where you got this ignition and you uh, suddenly rise the temperature inside. But sometimes, of course, you can't um, avoid it. But uh, it's very seldom. And if it happens, you probably the biggest problem is probably not the hands. You have uh, <laughs> we get burns all over it. You know. So that's that's my thoughts about it. Yeah, exactly, and and um, yeah. So it's like it's like a weight. Uh, yeah, should, yeah. There's for be, sure you need to uh, well balance different risks. Very well protected. It's it's uh, you have to. Well, all we can all we can say is try, try it out there. What suits you best? Either way, you have a much better protection of your hands for carcinogens and and, and thermal uptake. So and that, that would all, be the it, advice. Yeah. And I think it's also like we said before that, that you you shouldn't wear fire gloves for anything else than fighting fire. Like they're not for shoveling snow outside of the fire station. They're not for you warming your hands at a tra road traffic accident. They are fire gloves. They should be used to fire gloves because they're they're dirty and they're uncomfortable and they're like bulky and so but but I think we just have to be Again, like I consider, I can consider them to be contaminated gear all the time, more or less. So when I use them again in training, I use mostly nitrile because of it's smoother, but also because I don't, I don't, I don't deem the risk for anything thermically to be a problem. If I, you know, if that's that hot when I do training, I've done something horribly wrong <laughs> as an instructor. Um, but when I go to real fires, I typically don't have anything else. But by my fire gloves, simply because we're not issued anything else than fire gloves. But I, but actually, just a couple of weeks ago, I bought a pair of hundred cotton gloves where I put on my my bunker gear. So I'm going to use them at fires. Anyway, there, there's nothing against us using that. I would presume it's just that it, nobody has ever thought about it or you know made any effort towards issuing cotton gloves as part of a way to protect yourself. I mean, so there's a long way to go there, but. Like you said, if you can get away with 80% with cotton gloves, at least according to that study, that's a huge benefit. And if you can get, you know, 95% with nitrile gloves when you do training, um, uh, or if you use it operationally, I wouldn't have a big problem using it operationally either. Um, I think that's a very good one because I think the hands is uh, something that, you know, like if you look at, at a fire, you typically, even if you try to, try not to touch anything you're instantly dirty and i have this constant problem with at, when i do ex acquired structure burns i do that a lot like i i struggle to keep clean it's it's so hard and i probably go through 20 nitrile gloves and i acquired structure burn because i go out i fiddle with cameras and then i do something else and then i sort of get dirty and i take them off and i take some new ones on and it's and and then I use, which is another topic I wanted to cover, which is I use baby wipes. Now, when I started with baby wipes, there was a, there was a huge rise way after, like when the, all the commercial wipes started coming, all the firefighter branded wipes. Now they all claim, I still haven't seen anything convincing, 
to this date, but they all claim to be the best and the best and normal baby wipes are you know, not, not good at all. And they have their own studies to show it. They have paid some university and so on. And they all say that the other company's study is just a fake or it's just, you know, they paid to have this to study or it's not serious. I don't know anything. I just know that you should probably avoid alcohol in the baby wipes, for what I've understood, because it opens the pores. But if you don't have, if you don't have alcohol in them, at least I think it's a very good thing to do. Have you have you ever, you know, done any work with wipes, you know, on the on the scene, or or you know, had any thoughts on it being good or bad, or any considerations? I do have some thoughts about it. We we don't have we don't have studies uh, uh, more than than the ones you refer to. That even even um, every producer of wipes have their own like uh, evidence that this is the best on the market and, and yeah. so on. So and twice, um, twice as much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah, very yeah, good. Yeah. At, they're very good at charging money. Yeah, but I mean, they if it is good, you know, maybe it's true. But it's very hard to know. You know, when my idea with this uh, is actually, um, we we should always, the way we work, think about also the environment, right? And I mean, um, the same for all the firefighter wipes is they contain chemicals, right? Chemicals. <clears throat> are good for something, but not for everything, right? So there's a big production, you throw them away, what happens, <laughs> right? So why don't you just get out of the fire, take off your gloves, your hood the right way, and so on. Go to the, go to the engine, take, up, take out the, 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 the part of, of, of uh, the shells where where you have uh, a sink and and water, wash yourself with water, you know. And soap, water and soap. And, and, and water and soap. And, and once you do that, of course, do it to your face, your neck, uh, and, you know, those critical parts. Do that, do that every time you go, go out from the fire. Do it as the first thing. Uh, that would be that would be my suggestion. Use soap and water. Stop using all those chemicals. I mean, there's a reason why uh, there are baby wipes. I mean, you can have other kinds of wipes that are maybe more effective, right? But um, maybe it's not very good for baby skin. Do you think uh, adult skin is not as sensible? As, I mean, human skin is human skin. We just don't like to 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 see our babies, <laughs> you know, with red, yeah. red bottoms, uh, whatever. So so um, yeah, it's that would be my advice. Don't, don't use wipes. Use water and soap and common sense, right? Logic. Uh, what we there's can a, we there's do. a group. Uh, there's a group. Uh, I just want to make a little commercial because uh, there's a group called Green. Green skills for firefighters. Uh, we are part of that group. I don't know if you heard of it. But it's called Green Skills of Firefighters, and they are trying to look at how do we work. Is that is that good or bad for our environment? I mean, could we do it another way to save pollution to the environment? Could we work more intelligent? Right. And which is uh, makes sense? I mean, <laughs> obviously. Oh, absolutely. For obvious reasons. So, so um, that is really interesting. So, Tommy. so why should you use all those products yeah. just to throw them away? I, I, mean. I, I just want to comment on that, uh, Tommy. It's uh, I, I totally agree. Uh, what's most important? The overall important thing to do is, at once you are finished with fighting fire get cleaned up. The firefighter should get cleaned up as soon as possible. If you got a shower on the outside, go to the shower. If you have, the only thing you have is baby wipes, you use baby wipes. But as often as 
you yeah, fight a fire, you have water with you, and you have mostly have soap on the engine as well. So water and soap, clean up your face, neck, skin, and there you are. So that you, you use what you have, of course, but but water and soap, I believe, will cover mostly of uh, the needs you have. But sometimes you are exposed, you know, you like in, uh, and you don't have uh, the water around you, then baby wipes is very good, of course. I think I definitely yes, can I improve agree. myself there when I do acquired structure burns. I am... Um, there's nothing preventing me from like the, the most like modern fire trucks now usually come with uh you know some kind of compartment where you can get you get cleaned off like there's a way to wash your boots there's a way to wash your face and hands and so on with a small sink or some kind of drinkable water or at least clean water not tank water and so on so most modern fire trucks in Sweden and Norway and Denmark will have those features but when I do a choir structure burn it's not the newest fire truck that's assigned to the choir structure structure burn so they don't have anything besides like an ossel but there's nothing preventing me from from of course bringing a a, a, a 25 liter of, of of bottle and rinsing myself off better after acquired structure burn that is for sure i don't have to use baby wipes and probably not problem not as effective to use baby wipes rather than put my head under and there's also very refreshing when you get out of a fire to also put some cold water over your head and neck and and, and clean off now some kind of heat heat tolerant uh some some kind of uh, this is a scientist that's discussing about like the body's ability to, to recover from heat say you shouldn't cool certain parts of your body because the, the blah, blah, blah. that's a different this is a different question but anyway i, I definitely for sure uh, uh, make myself um, a better situation after i come out of expired structure burn because then i go in and out all the time i go in and out all the time so i don't have time to make a shower but at least i have time to rinse off um now so we talked about we talked about baby wipes so one thing i also want to cover of course is when we've, we've, we've been into it is is uh, limit exposure in terms of tactics and so on and i just want to have a short com uh, conversation about that too and i think that <clears throat> there is there is a there's a minefield here internationally like in the minefield is when is a building empty or not there is, there is, and, and I'm not going to go into that one because there's no answer. Some say, well, the building is empty if we just assume it is empty. Like if there's a vacant building and in Sweden, for instance, like vacant buildings, there's, there's such a incredibly low chance that there's anyone in there. Like nobody lives in vacant buildings in Sweden. I, I would say nobody, but there's very, very rare because there's, you know, social housing everywhere and there's. It's a very small chance, but there is a chance. Now, if you go to a different city in, for instance, United States or other countries, like, like there's, a, there's, a, there's a very high probability that vacant buildings have people in the, them that, that are living in there. So when you ask lines like, when is a building empty or not, you will get a very different response to, depending on where you were working and who you are. And if your, your response is, every building is occupied until we have made sure as a fire service that that is the case it's very hard to say that you should stand on the outside spraying water because you don't want to have cancer uh, again that that's a minefield starting there but let's just say that we think there's a person in there or it might be a person in there or we definitely know there's a person in there I would argue that there's still a lot of benefits a lot of times to, for instance, do a quick hit from the outside anyway to take temperature down so that we can start the fan. You're not going to get rid of all the smoke instantaneously, but if you can start the fan by doing something about the fire f faster, then you will gradually decrease contaminations as well as improve invisibility and, and so on on your way to the fire or if you start it just when you get to the fire but early ventilation is as, as important to rescue as it is to fire uh, cancer prevention which means that I, I would say that there's a direct link between getting more effective at doing rescues as it is to reducing risk to firefighters both cancer and thermal threat as ventilation and 
Sweden, as well as Norway and Denmark, if you go back to the 80s and 90s, proud ourselves, again, like you said, Tommy, <laughs> about going into the fire, using as little water as possible, basically crawling up to the, you know, the lap of the fire and then put some water on it because we wanted to prevent water damages. And then they teared the building down anyway. Um, now I would say I think we are getting into a period of firefighting where I would say and I hope that people start valuing the ability to save lives, of course, but also the, the safety of firefighters and the, the risk of cancer exposure to firefighters that we should use way more water. We should be way more aggressive with cooling that and way more aggressive thus when we're cooling to start the fan and reducing the smoke in the building and that is not a switch we've done effectively so far we haven't we we're still very much focused on going inside and fighting it from the belly of the beast you know i have to comment on that because i've been working on that in in our, our fire department in many years uh, regarding using this uh, Cobra, uh, you know, what do you call it in a, a cold cutting Cobra? You, you can cut through walls and iron and stuff very sufficient and effective. And uh, <clears throat> this is mostly, you know, you know, the fire officer commanders, they need to know the, what kind of work, the tools that are working and not. And, you know, when you are out at the scene and, and and it's a lot of things happening and people inside. You do what you always do. You do what you know works. You don't experiment. You don't try other things because you, you, you are too, uh, too uh, you have to uh, accomplish this goal and you do what you know works, you know? So you, it needs to, uh, to use other tools, to use other tactics, it, it, it takes many years to develop this and to get that kind of things integrated in the fire service. So when we started on this in, in Bergen, about, we got the first car with this uh, equipment in 2012 in Bergen. And now it's the last yeah, three, four years, we are really using it in almost every fire. So then you you have changed the tactics a, a lot but in, at the same time when you know there are people inside that's the the most valued thing there and then so if you have to exposure your firefighters you do it because that's the one time you do it and you need to save that life you don't have many seconds or minutes to do other things but in the same time if the the the, the firefighters are drilled you can, you can do things simultane simultaneously. You know, some of people are using the fire extinguisher from the outside. Okay, you li like it is cold cut cobra thing. And, uh, you know, one firefighter uh, uh, take the glass on the other side, maybe a door on the other side to, to make a, a ventilation for the smoke to take it out. And some the firefighters that are going inside, they are dressing up and also starting the fan when they are ready. So if you if you have, can coordinate the different uh, kind of work at the scene, you can do both. You know, you have a healthy, more a better environment for the firefighters to to smoke dive in. It will be smoke there, of course, but you know, much less smoke and better sight and more much more effective work inside the house to search, to search for the people that are missed. So that's, that's my theory. And uh, I, I believe that uh, it takes, you, you have to do the change, but it, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to work it in and work it in over years. So you have to trust uh, the equipment, trust the, trust the tactics and to, uh, to use it when it's really is a life lives to save inside. <clears throat> in, I think it was 2004. I can't even remember when I started in my first professional fire brigade. It was it was about the time where with that department has just bought the cold cut cobra, 
It was, you know, like 2000s started, the, you know, in Sweden, you know, the Kolka Cobra started to gain some traction. So, and I remember how furious the firefighters were. Like I, I was new, so I, I did, you know, like your news stand in the corner, don't say anything. So I, you know, and I didn't have like references. So I, I was just, I was just like, you know, following the culture, like being angry as anyone else, because it was sold in the beginning as first off a universal tool, which is not. It's a very good tool for cooling fire gases from outside and so on. But the second one is was sold as a way to increase safety. And I learned quickly and by traveling the world that firefighters do not want to be safe. <laughs> like intellectually, they want to be safe. Like, like the, no, nobody likes to die. Like everybody wants to come home. But you don't sell anything to firefighters with safety. If you say that, you know, like, you, you know, you should do this to then you'll be safer. Don't want to be. Firefighters didn't be, become firefighters to be safe. They wanted to be, they wanted to be firefighters because it was cool, because they want to save lives, they want to be heroes. And that is universally. Like, there's, that's culture is, like, there's flavors to it. Like, the, the flavor of the American fire service and the Swedish fire service are vastly different. But the same embryos there, there's the same people wanting to join the fire service. They want action. They want to be heroes. So my my key point was the, the thing I said, like, like, if I sell people a way to be more effective, and I generally think that, like, if, you're, if you learn to use tools and actions to cool from the outside, that can increase or decrease the time it takes for us to commence ventilation. And that, in, in turn, will, com- will reduce the time it takes us for us to start to save lives. We find them faster in a less contaminated environment and so on. If you sell firefighters on the concept of, of being more effective at rescue, even if, if, we, if, we, even if we take away all the, all the exterior cooling parts, let's say you can only go interior. If, you, if you're even more effective at going interior, so you're faster, move dragon hose line. You're faster at searching. You're faster at starting to ventilate. You're faster at, at, at using your thermal imager to search faster and so on. That indirectly will make you less exposed. And it's much, much, much easier to sell safety to politicians and it's much much easier to sell efficiency and effectiveness and bad assertiveness <laughs> to firefighters <laughs> so i talk entirely different but i say the same thing if someone asks me let's I go to fire chief conference or something and they tell me like how to how do i look at tomorrow's firefighting i will tell you the exact same thing but from a different perspective this is how you become more financially effective, small units, dispersed, and so on. But I'm trying to achieve the same thing. When I talk to firefighters, I say, this is how you become a badass. And I think that's very important, especially you as a communicators of, of, of safety. Like, you're trying to make people safe. Like, and I think that's very, very important. Like, I don't talk safety. I never talk safety. I only talk badassery when I do firefighter training. But this, the, the indirect implication of badassery is, if you talk correct, correctly, is safety in terms of, of whatever it might be, structural collapse or the thermal threat of fire or cancer exposure. Um, so that is, that is if someone asked me, like, how do you prevent cancer and firefighters? You go, like, make them better. <laughs> like, make firefighters more effective. That, like, that, that's a huge part of it. Um, now that that doesn't solve all the things, doesn't solve how you decon your gear and how which kind of equipment you should have, and you should clean it. That's part of changing the culture, which I think we sort of have. Besides the lazy part, that's still a problem. <laughs> um, but I think that's a, that's a, that's a very important piece of the puzzle. Like firefighters need to be badass. Otherwise, you know, like why would I keep keep doing this job if it wasn't like an element of badass in it? Like that's that's, sure, that's, I that's mean, why that, I joined. That's, that's in our DNA. <laughs> uh, yeah. Saving lives yes. and being badasses. It's it's, it's like a, or badass. It like yeah, you're right. You're right. It's you know, it's yeah. it's uh, it's dangerous to be a firefighter. But it's also damn um, nice, right? Yes, I mean, it's it's really so cool. You get the uh, yeah, you you get to live on the edge, you know. Yeah, and, and, and that's just cool. I don't, you know, when I was off duty, 
my my kids always told me when when uh, when I was driving the, the the car, Dad, you're driving like an old man. Can, can't you just just speed it up a bit? You know, I don't need to because I I got it on the job, right? <laughs> I have all that on the job. <laughs> of course, I could uh, I could do diving or or or, or sky uh, skydiving or whatever uh, <laughs> to get the adrenaline, but I don't need to get the adrenaline because I have it on the job, right? And it is cool and it's fun and it's it's great. The the camaraderie and, and, and the shift, everything is great about it, right? And you and you get to save lives. I mean, that's so cool. How cool is that, right? Yeah, so, super so, cool. Um, yeah. But, but, if, but, I, but if, if I want to be safe and save lives, I would work in an ambulance. <laughs> well that's oh, just reality yeah. and that has to be addressed yeah. like the people joined the fire service for a reason again they you didn't know? join the ambulance and they did for sure not work as at the hospital like yeah <laughs> when i when i drew the ambulance i you know my life has been in danger <laughs> more times driving the ambulance than being a firefighter actually yeah right <laughs> well like I, absolutely yeah, yeah. I, could, I could understand so, that so so but, but anyway so you're talking talking about this, um, you know, how you sell it. You, you sell it to be badass, and, and uh, you know, picture you're a, you're this firefighter hero, right? In my in my eyes, firefighters are true heroes. I mean, who else want to 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 uh, put their life on the line to save others, right? I mean, basically that that's what they are. And so, but there are other heroes as well. So picture this, uh, you know, you know the Tarzan syndrome, right? You know, yeah. f forget about it. Tarzan's, Tarzan's dead, right? But but Bruce Willis is still alive, right? <laughs> he's a hero as well. Picture, you know, you know Bruce Willis with with yeah. uh, you know he's all dirty and and you know stepping on glass and yeah. you know and everything. So, but he, he he is dirty, you know. Who? Other than his wife wants to sleep with him <laughs> in that state, right? Well, so I, we have another hero also, yeah. you know, 007. Uh, he can do everything as well. He's also a hero, can yeah. do all the stuff the ha half the time. But he is a, you know, a clean, well looking gentleman, yeah. you know? He runs off with even more ladies because they want they want a clean, uh, you know, gentleman. Yeah. And, and, and you know, picture that you you are you're not gonna be a dirty, filthy firefighter. You have to be a clean, gentleman firefighter. You are much better <laughs> off with the ladies, and, and you probably live longer. To enjoy all those ladies, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what, just uh, just to give you that picture. <laughs> right. it, it is a great one, and I think it, it ties into. I, I wrote a, a small article on on LinkedIn just another day ago. There there is a there is a, a strange connection between how hard it is to save a li life and how much we value it. Like there's a like we value a life higher if you save it from a fire than from a cardiac arrest, and we right. value it more than we save from a cardiac arrest than if it, for instance, in a cancer. Like there's and the whole society reflects that, and it's and it's probably linked to the story. Like we we like the story of a of a saved life. Like if the story's better, if it's if it's like a, a miners in a mine, we can put endless amount of resources of saving those miners trapped under a mine if it's you know like an old person in a bed you know with with some kind of disease you know not so much it's that's statistics so there's a link between this how hard it is to save a life and how much you value it and i think that's 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 the sort of your, your excellent analogy with with bruce willis and and 007 if we put more effort in saving a life we we value our own effort more like if i am dirty tired you know like half beat up gear is half burned away and i make a rescue i am more valuable to myself i made a bigger sacrifice therefore i value it higher and other people value it higher like that's how we put value in things but if i'm super smart 
and I, you know, like I, I, let's say I shoot a water in through a window and I put a fan on and I just walk in. I'm not even dirty, half sweaty. And I arrive to a room where the, the, the door was closed. Now I just open the door in a good environment and there's the old lady and we walk out together. It's sort of like she didn't sort of didn't even rescue at all. I just put the fire out and took away the smoke and now, now she could leave. Like the firefighter who went in and maybe made, maybe, maybe made, poor tactical decisions poor skills decision open that door in that hot corridor let all the smoke into that old lady who's sitting in the room fairly good until the fire service arrived <laughs> that is a real hero half burned sweaty sooty but the one who made very tactically sound decisions is is sort of not re re rewarded in the same way you know um, the, the most I, yeah, yeah if i may the, the most uh, famous firefighter rescuing picture yeah that's not that's not the the the, the fighting the fire it's the cat in the tree right <laughs> i yeah. mean so <laughs> yeah well so the it, story it, is it, very it, important it, it, yeah it's a, it's a, <laughs> but i think it's a, i think it's, it's, it's i think it's important it's that change, right and and the, the same as your 10 years ago we were filthy the 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 the, the the code of honor right so um to like today that is not the the culture in the nordic countries and the code of of, of honor that is being clean and, and healthy right so it is culture change and it does not make you less good firefighter less masculine less a man to be uh, intelligent about your own safety and health on the opposite. Well, I think, I mean, uh, uh, we're just going to round up here, but I mean, the reason, one of the reasons I called myself the fire nerd, um, one of the reasons why I was, be I was called that by others, <laughs> but one of the reasons I picked that was very specifically because I wanted to make I think there is a there's a, there's a new revolution making the the 007 the smart effective firefighter not not the, not the the Bruce Willis type. I think you can be this this the the 007 of firefighting. Um be very effective and still have when it's needed of course you need to have the ability to get down and dirty. That's that's just that's just part of the game. <laughs> but I think that story of how we value smart firefighting is is still very much needed to be told to change the perception again about what what a good firefighter is um and in sweden and in norway and denmark i think we've gotten a lot a bit a very much further than a lot of other countries in rebranding the firefighter in, into more of that kind of firefighter um but Again, if you if you if you start the conversation with "Hey, we're going to give you a cold cut cobra, and that will make you safer, but maybe not better at saving lives," that's that's that nobody buys that. So yeah. we still have to go like, "Yeah, we want you to make it easier for yourself," because a lot of times that automatically makes it easier for the people we should save too. <clears throat> and that is the first buy-in. Now we we need to round up here, but I want to I want to just end on. First, if you if you have anything you, you feel like we haven't touched upon on this subject, there's there's so much. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but uh, if, if you don't want to touch on saying, feel free. But but also just like a quick heads up on like the nearest year. What are you looking forward to in terms of this area when it comes to new knowledge studies that you're looking at? Uh, like like little little, little get bit in a, in the in the in the what do you call it? The small future bowl. <laughs> uh, Tom in Norway. Yes, if I get to start. Uh, the first thing is that, it, you, you know, one of the big things for us to do here in Norway is to travel around to speak to Norwegian firefighters, to tell them what we have learned and to share our experience. But because of the COVID-19, we haven't done that yet. And, and now it seems to lighten up and uh, some of the things we are going to do is exactly that. We are, have been contacted by lots of fire departments and uh, firefighters and they want us out to um, tell about 
our experience and knowledge regarding the cancer issue. And the other thing is uh, we are now um, in a couple of months going to have a seminar in, in Bergen in Norway. It's in the uh, 9th and 10th of November. And um, then we get uh, hopefully all the results regarding the Norwegian studies on firefighters. And uh, I think uh, that will be a kind of, uh, I, I think and hope it will be a game changer because you, you get to, to manifest that the problem isn't a lot of, in the, a lot of countries than Norway where the studies have been done. But it, the problem is uh, uh, similar in Norwegian as well. So we have to do things. One of the things is to, to prevent cancer. The other thing is to take care of the firefighters that get uh, hit by occupational cancer. And that's, that's uh, uh, we have to lift it up to the politicians, and we have been there, but they need to, they need the numbers, the studies. So we are getting there, uh, I believe. And uh, to, to just, we have about five different cancers getting approved regarding the Norwegian systems. So a uh, firefighter just got uh, approved as occupational cancer, but every firefighter have, has to fight their own fight every time. Uh, so we need to, to do some changes like they have done in Canada and U United States to make it easier is, uh, to, to get there. So you don't have to do the long fight. So hopefully that will happen next year. So we'll, we'll see about that. We'll cross our fingers. Sounds very good. Mm. Tommy, Denmark. Yeah. Yes, good luck with that, uh, with that Tommy. And uh, of course, as always, you have my uh, support. 100% as, as I know I have yours, which is a good corroboration we have uh, between the Nordic countries. And um, so my hope for the, the, the near future is um, um, domestic is to, to um, keep on pushing for better prevention for um, legislation to, to, to cover cancers more or less automatically so that every firefighter should not uh, have the struggle, the burden of proof, which is uh, really unfair. So we, we will continue that work as we speak. Uh, and uh, the other thing is to, um, to enlighten our, uh, our cooperation like we do in the Nordic countries we even want to make that better, and that's going to happen. That's going to happen um, uh, this November eighth uh, in Bergen, because yeah, because we'll have the meetings uh, before the seminar, uh, and one of the big agendas there will be, you know, to give ourselves even stronger handshakes to uh, share knowledge, to be there for each other, even more than we are already doing. And I want to push that further into Europe. I already did that for my organization. We already did that. Uh, you know, we got Germany in, <laughs> we got Portugal in, we have a lot of countries in Poland in. So we want Belgium in. <laughs> so we want to extend that. So, so that we will have a European firefighter cancer society you know as we have our national societies we want a european one as well to cooperate and to spread the knowledge and to help each other's firefighters and the firefighters families just today this morning i was at a funeral 50 year old firefighter died of cancer he left he left um, a wife and two children, right? And definitely that was occupational. The same story as you told Tommy, they had to sell the house, uh, you know, because they, the, the, the wife, because they knew he would die. So they sold their house, bought a, a, a smaller house. So the wife and kids could afford staying there. They use a lot of, valuable energy doing that. And that is not 
fair. We want to help those families, more of those families, right? It's not fair to do that, to treat a dying firefighter and his family like that. They should use their last time enjoying life together because it will be over soon. And this is real. And to all you politicians out there, make it happen. Make the legislation, please. <laughs> yeah, I know they will. You know, there will be a lot of politicians listening to your podcast, Lars. Well, if, they so. are, if they are wise, they will do that. And they, they will really take it into account. Firefighters need their own heroes. Their own heroes is the politicians recognizing our issues. And that's for common good. It's good for everybody. So that's my hope for the near future. The long future, that's another business. Well, well, it sounds like you have a lot to do the nearest the nearest year if you want to do that. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> we, have, the we luck. have the Cancer uh, Society uh, yeah. helping, helping up like that. And the Nordic uh, cooperation. That That's really important. It means a lot. The, it means the world to me. We just need even more. Yeah, that's very good. We have a good cooperation between the countries, all the Nordic countries, and uh, share information, supporting each other. So, and, and that works very good. And uh, I, I one thing for you, Lars, that to get to get forward the good tactics regarding this to prevent cancer but because that's a way to prevent cancer as well so what we are teaching each other regarding firefighting is how to how to do it in a 007 way you know so uh, so we have uh, different uh, challenges in different sections of firefighting Lars let me tell you this magazine do you know this magazine I can't read it the quality is not good enough. It says Brandfolkets Cancerforening. What do you want to know about what you need to know about you need cancer, uh, occupational okay, cancer? Exactly. And this is our magazine. It's in it's in Danish and in English. And, oh, and I didn't know if you had a magazine. I've never seen that. Yeah, it's free. It's free for downloading from our website. Oh, right? I didn't know. Uh, I think you should go in there because we have some uh, we have some. Um, in the magazine, uh, uh, some procedures, some good advice, how to Excellent. deal, how to, how to deal uh, with yourself in the station, in the fire scene, and after the fire. Right? Excellent. What can you do yourself? What do you need uh, more help to do? Right? I just remember that I need to ask one more question before we end, because otherwise, uh, I know a lot of people are going to be angry at me. Uh, <laughs> so you can't go yet. No. So the question revolves around saunas, because if I get one no. question <laughs> in America, and, and from a lot of places also, but especially in America, it's about saunas, because firefighters want saunas, probably because it's nice, <laughs> but they also want it for decontamination. Now, the story about the Swedish fire service, which is, you know, of course, the Finnish also, I don't know if as well as the Danish and Norwegian, but it's it, basically every fire station in Sweden, there's a sauna. And that was because of old legislation about heat tolerance training. It has nothing to do with decontamination. So after physical workout, you were supposed to sit in the sauna for 20 minutes or something to, to, to heat tolerant your body. That was part of legislation. So it was a recommendation. Now that is also because it's part of, of course, Finnish culture at, at most, but also Swedish culture to have a sauna. I don't know if it's as much in Norway and Denmark, but but to, to a lar large extent, it is still a big, very big part, part of the culture. Now, anyway, now that became eventually a way to decon. And now that came out to be anecdotally because after a fire or when you go training, you smell bad. And you go into a sauna and you smell way less bad. So anecdotally, people thought when, when this started to come up about cancer that this has to be good because you smell less bad. Now, I have, have, have three hypotheses that seems to be problematic. One, you're going to the sauna, you start sweating, and you're sweating stuff out and that's bad stuff and you get healthier. Hypothesis two, 
you get into the sauna, you open the pores, and stuff start to come in. Like because you, the hotter you get, the more things you absorb. That's that's how just the body works. Three, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever because all the damages already done is within your blood circulation, so it has to be processed by your liver. So, which of these hypotheses would you think is correct? Denmark, let's go. Well, uh, so there's actually been a few studies about um, about sauna, and um, the reason why we we have saunas in, in, in Danish fire services, most of them, most, most of the full time, not the part time. They don't care about part time or volunteers uh, yet, <laughs> but uh, they will because they are exposed to all the same carcinogens. But <clears throat> it's actually because of the smell. All, um, all, all workers that are smelling bad after work have to have the opportunity to go into a sauna because after the sauna, you don't smell that bad. So that was the, the legislation in Denmark, the reason it was why. A, it, was a, it was a smell legislation. It was a smell legislation. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, really. Yeah, well, well so, hey, you know, it's, so, it's so, good reasons. Uh, anyway. Actually, um, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Burgess from um, University of Arizona, uh, also, one of our our um, cooperatives <laughs> um, made a few studies, a few uh, sauna uh, studies, uh, and it seems that it actually removes some of the toxins. It does not remove everything, obviously, because something you are already have inside your body, but. Uh, the sizes of the particle is what um, um, the, the smaller the particles, the faster they travel through the skin. It can be uh, three hours or two days before it travels through the skin. So the, we, are, we are actually beginning to talk about the golden hour, which is actually two hours. Uh, from you get into the fire uh, two hours after you should actually have been into a shower and into the sauna right so something points in the direction that you actually remove remember when you're exposed through the carcinogens, your pores are already open because you're in a hot environment. So if you close the pores, you just contain it inside the, the skin. What happens when you go to the sauna, as you say, you open up the pores and, and where you have the sweat pores, you remove the carcinogens from, from, from those pores. And you don't want to use soap in this in the shower before you go into the sauna because some of the soap mo you, you have to make sure the soap does not contain a, a, a plastic right most soaps have plastic so if you uh, if you put soap on your skin with plastics that's why it gets so soft and nice because you have like you put on an extra skin right yeah. That's, the, that's the plastic. So you, you contain it even more. So just shower, go into the sauna, sweat for five minutes, go out to the, to the shower once more, shower it off. Then you can use soap, right? It's not really difficult, but, but we are actually at the moment, actually, what, what was it? It's, what day is it today? It's, it's, it's Friday. First, it's Friday, yesterday. Yesterday we applied. No, we Thursday. Applied. Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. It was today. <laughs> of course. Uh, so, so it's today. <laughs> so many things happened today. So <laughs> today we um, again our organization with uh, with some universities. We applied for fundings to do regular sauna tests. Like, and we are Excellent. in cooperation with Jeffrey Burgess and and, and some other um, high profile scientists about this because it's not it, 
it doesn't seem like it's an it's a question if it helps. But now we are nerding a little bit. There are different kinds of sauna. We are talking the traditional sauna, you know, where you put the water on the on the yeah. sauna. Uh, uh, yeah, Finnish yeah. sauna would be. Yeah. No, not the Finnish one because the Finnish one is a smoke sauna. Actually, we don't want to go into <laughs> oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but but anyway, so the traditional electrical sauna. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. Well. Yeah. And um, and uh, and then there we we have infrared saunas. So we want to find out the difference. What what is what is the best to use? Because what what happens when you go into the sauna? You you uh, heart rate races and 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 now we are it is nerding maybe it has no uh, effect we don't know yet but <clears throat> but the more the faster your blood pumps around in your body the more <laughs> of course it releases but the more it takes in as well and that doesn't have that does not happen in an infrared sauna but the effect is the same that you sweat that's what you want to do, but your pulse is not raising the same level as in a traditional sauna. So maybe the infrared sauna uh, is what we uh, we want to to recommend. But we don't have all the uh, data yet. Uh, we don't have the data. We only have the data that Jeffrey Burgess and 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 a few other data to to rely on here. We have now ongoing a Danish study. That's an, it, it's another um, uh, university doing that. Um, it, it will be finished in two years' time. It will take time. But uh, they will do some sauna tests as well. So more data is coming up. But what we, what we know, the knowledge we have now is that it's, it actually removes some of the carcinogens. So having a sauna in uh, in each and every fire station is a good thing. It's not only for recreation. But you have, you know, you get rid of, of the soot in your in your skin, you know. Uh, so we know it's a kind of prevention. But I haven't got or read any published studies regarding this. Studies, there is theories, isn't it? Or do you, there, is there is, it, yeah, there is, is one. There is one study. Uh, the one I, I referred to uh, from Jeffrey Burgess. Yeah. Can you share it with me? That would be great. Of course. Yeah. 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 One, uh, one thing. I, I just had a meeting with him like a month ago uh, and some other scientists as well uh, because of this. So, so we are, we are trying to put all, uh, to put together all the science that, that is available on, on saunas. So, yeah. I just want to comment, uh, uh after a big fire, you are sweat. You are you have low on the, the water level in your body is low as well. So you have to be. Uh, you don't want to sweat too much afterwards. So you have to fill up with water as well, and it takes time to refill your body. So you have to balance it regarding how much uh, you spend time spending in the sauna and to refill the water as well. Yes, you're right, and that's why you're not going to stay in the sauna for one hour. You go in there, you sweat for five minutes. I think I, I, I think I said that just for five minutes, and then get out of here. Of course, yeah. always you always have to to stay well hydrated as a firefighter. Yeah. Now, yeah. now I have. <laughs> damn it, I have more questions, but I will, I will, I will, I will. <laughs> I was. Uh, First off, I got a question. So how do you clean the sauna? I got a question. So I go like, never thought about that because <laughs> I was talking to American firefighters. They'll go like, well, if you're sweating out things that are carcinogenic, where do they go? Like, I go, well, they go into the sauna. <laughs> so that's why I so got it. It makes a lot of sense to sit on a towel and let that soak up into the towel and then get that clean. I guess that, but we clean the sauna, but I mean, it probably gets into the wood and so on. Now, that's, let's not get into that one. You know, it's that, an but, excellent question. I, I, you know, I love those kinds of questions <laughs> because uh, it, it always makes you think ahead one more step. Yeah. So, great I question. Like yeah. Where do they go? <laughs> yeah. they go? No, I, I don't nowhere. know. Maybe, maybe I'm, 
Maybe I'm sitting in a 30-year-old sauna with 30 years of, of, of cancerous fires in the walls. Go like, <laughs> yeah. am I getting it, more cancer now or less? That's why it, the wood is getting darker. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No. it's not because of the heat. It's actually no, the, no, no, the, no. the soot. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, I want to just end with this because it might be a good good end. Uh, so the first time I heard about the the sauna being ca- uh, used for decontamination, I read the studies from 9-11. So from 9-11, there was a lot of, of, of people getting contaminated after the rescue with, with dust and so on. And there were studies on using, using um, saunas to sweat out some of these bad examples now these studies were made and there was they were positive about certain kinds of things you could sweat out by using sauna therapy but that crashed sort of when it was realized from the people reading it that it was funded by the scientology uh, the same guys who started scientology i think or, or some uh, yeah, maybe it wasn't yeah i think it was scientology or something so there, it was a problem of who funded the study and why and they were offering cleansing treatments for people to do and so so it was highly questionable and just to add on i've talked to a lot of you know people um who were interested in this and and some of them are super pro sauna and some of them are just like violently against it so it's going to be super interesting to see those studies coming out when they look more about that because it's still i would really hope that it's good because i like it and it sounds <laughs> nice <laughs> yeah you know the knowledge the knowledge available for now yeah is pointing uh, clearly in that direction and that, that it's good. And no matter what, it's not harmful. It doesn't harm you. It, it actually um, it's recreative as well as, as it maybe is decontaminating de- de- uh, or de- yeah. detoxing. And, and, you know, we have to also consider our um, psychological well-being. And you get that actually from the sauna. You know, right. So so so, so they, that way a sauna is yeah. good as as well. And the more the more healthy you are you are in in in, in psychological yeah. aspect, better person you are. Better you are better at fighting uh, diseases and everything. So we can we can for sure be be agreed on that saunas are very very good. It's just a question of are they good right after a fire. That's that's the only question that might exist, or it may just be a person of how good they are. Is, yeah. Are they very good and just a little bit good? Okay, excellent. We just talked for almost three hours, which is excellent. I was very but happy about you, this. You promised me eight hours. Yeah. yeah. Well, I said I could. We could talk for eight hours. We should. Yeah, we we, have, we have still a lot of questions we can dive into. I still but have. Maybe, maybe we can uh, have another session later ones yeah well i think so i mean i would i will probably have a conversation with anders which is the (laughs) cancer guy in sweden Um, and and after you've you know you both of you have some studies that is going to be published during during the autumn uh you're going to have your conference and after the conference where you've gathered your thoughts and stuff that would be excellent to do another roundup and hopefully have anders with as well and by then, I've also probably tried mm-hmm. the the new underwear, carbon underwear, also the yeah. high tech stuff. And maybe I'll, you know, like may a ma- manufacturer make me an overall again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. With, I, with I a heard filter. about that uh, uh, from uh, Anders as well, and that it, it it it's so promising, right? Yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. That's very good. It's very interesting. 